Hello and welcome to the newscast. I'm Daniel Che here to provide you with the latest. The youngest of three French nationals suspected to be behind an attack that killed 12 people at a satirical magazine turns himself into the police. A massive manhunt is underway for the other two. Markets across the world are feeling the effects of sinking oil prices. It has inflation forecast for Korea slipping into the 0% range. The FBI chief says he is absolutely positive that North Korea was behind the Sony hack attack and that the regime will strike again unless something is done. We begin with the latest from the carnage in Paris that has left the world in shock. An intensive manhunt is underway for the perpetrators of the terror attack that left 12 people dead at the Paris office of the French satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo. For details, we connect live to our Kim Minji at the news center. Minji, French authorities have identified the shooters, and I hear one of them is a teenager, and he surrendered to the police. That's right, Daniel. AFP reports that the youngest of the three suspects, an 18-year-old identified as Hamid Murad, has turned himself in to police. This is as authorities carry out large police operations to locate the remaining two. Police have released photos of the suspects, still at large, brothers Saeed and Sharif Kouachi, both of whom are in their 30s. Police have issued arrest warrants for them. Both are considered to be armed and dangerous. Media reports say Sharif was a militant sentenced to three years in prison on terror charges back in 2008 for helping to funnel jihadist fighters to Iraq. Uh, President Francois Hollande has denounced the shootings as a terror attack and set Thursday as a day of mourning. They left their mark on generations and generations of French through their influence through their insolence, through their rare independence. Here, I want to say to them, we will continue to defend it, this message of freedom in their name. And this in France, a country where it's not easy to attain firearms. Uh, now, the French government has stepped up security across the nation in the wake of the attack. Let's go over the details of the shooting itself on Wednesday, Minji. Yeah, sure. It took place just before noon on Wednesday when heavily armed gunmen stormed an editorial meeting at the Paris office of Charlie Hebdo and opened fire. The attack seemed very organized, the shooters reportedly calling the victim's name before executing them. And then just minutes later, the gunmen were seen calmly leaving the building to get into a waiting black car, then abandoning it and hijacking a second one. Altogether, 12 are dead, and that includes the editor as well as prominent cartoonists and two police officers. But the magazine is no stranger to courting controversy. Its most recent tweet on Twitter mocked the uh, leader of the Islamic State, and the office had been under tight security, especially after its offices were firebombed in 2011. Um, that came after it released a cover featuring a caricature of the Prophet Muhammad, which is considered blasphemy. Well, Minji, people around the world are showing their solidarity to France in their time of need. Yeah, that's right. People in Paris held a silent vigil and lit candles at a makeshift shrine close to the offices of Charlie Hebdo and other locations across the nation. World leaders were also quick to condemn the attack. Take a listen. This horrific attack is meant to divide. We must not fall into that trap. This is a moment for solidarity around the world. We must stand strong for freedom of expression and tolerance and stand against the forces of division and hate. Uh, the most important thing I want to say is uh, that uh, our thoughts and prayers are with the families of those uh, who've been lost in France uh, and with the people of Paris and the people of France, uh, uh, those who uh, carry out senseless attacks against innocent civilians, um, ultimately they'll be forgotten. Uh, and we will stand with the people of France uh, through this very, very difficult time. Protests and vigils are also being held across Europe and elsewhere in the world, showing their support for Paris at this very difficult time. But the world is growing to be a very small place where we are all one, basically. Our hearts and prayers go out to the victims of the tragedy. And thank you, Minji, for that report. She will bring us the details and the latest as it develops. Uh, we move on to different stories now. Now, Korea and Japan will hold economic talks in Seoul on Thursday afternoon. Seoul's Deputy Minister for Economic Affairs, 
An chong -gi, and his Japanese counterpart Yasumasa Nagamine. We'll talk over ways to strengthen economic cooperation in this, the 50th year since diplomatic ties were established between the two countries. Korea is expected to raise its concerns about Japan's quantitative easing and the effects of the weak Japanese yen within global markets. The proposed trilateral free trade agreement between Korea, Japan and China will also be on the agenda. On Japan's end, they are likely to ask that Korea resume imports of fishery goods, which were suspended back in 2013 following the Fukushima nuclear disaster. These are the second high-level economic talks between the two sides since President Park Geun-hye took office nearly two years ago. The South Korean parliament is one step closer to passing a resolution that urges Seoul and Pyongyang to mutually refrain from verbally attacking each other. The National Assembly's Foreign Affairs and Unification Committee voted in favor of the resolution this Tuesday morning that calls for an end to slander between the two Koreas. It also urges the government to take action against South Korean civic groups that fly anti-Pyongyang leaflets across the border if it harms inter-Korean relations. Unification Minister Ryu gil who attended the session, said the government would take necessary measures if the safety of people near the border region were threatened. The bill will go up for a full vote at the National Assembly on Monday. The top man at the FBI says he's more confident than ever that North Korea was responsible for the hack attack on Sony Pictures. And adding to that, Washington's top intelligence chief warned Pyongyang could launch additional cyber attacks against the United States. Our Kwon Sowa has the story. There is no doubt. The FBI seems more confident than ever that North Korea was behind the recent hacking of Sony Pictures. That's what James Comey, the bureau's director, said Wednesday during a speech at a cybersecurity conference in New York. Why do I have such high confidence in this attribution to North Korea? Now, here's the tricky part. Um, I want to show you as much as I can, the American people, about the why, and I want to show the bad guys as little as possible about the how. But while stressing the bureau has to preserve its methods and sources, he did give some explanation on why the FBI is certain. When the hackers sent emails, they would use proxy servers for disguise, but at times they got, quote, sloppy and were directly connected. That's when the FBI caught IP addresses only used by North Koreans. And on the same day at the same location, James Clapper, Washington's top intelligence chief, warned there is a high probability North Korea will launch more cyber attacks on the United States, calling the recent hacking the most serious attack of its kind against U.S. interests, resulting in huge financial losses. He added the cyber world is a powerful new realm for Pyongyang. If they get global recognition at a low cost with no consequence, they will do it again and keep doing it again until we push back. And, of course, others will follow suit. Clapper went on to say that if nothing is done to punish North Korea, the regime will continue to lash out. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. North Korea has called on the U.S. government to lift recently applied sanctions on the regime, again denying it had anything to do with the hacking attack on Sony Pictures. Pyongyang's demand comes roughly a week after U.S. President Barack Obama signed an executive order authorizing sanctions against three North Korean entities and 10 officials, on top of those imposed on the North for its past nuclear tests and missile launches. The country's National Defense Commission says the latest sanctions are hostile and repugnant as they were imposed with no solid evidence linking the North to the hacking. The commission said Washington should remove the punitive measures right away or face the threat of a military response. Markets around the world are feeling the pinch of the recent drop in oil prices. Here in Korea, the finance minister says the economy could end up benefiting. But others are raising concerns of deflation and financial firms at home and abroad have, their, have downgraded rather their inflation rate forecasts for this year. Our Shin Se-min reports. There are concerns that spiraling global oil prices could push Korea's annual inflation rate down to its lowest level in 16 years into the 0% range this year. 
Financial firms at home like Samsung Securities and the Korean Development Institute have downgraded their forecast to below 1%. Overseas Credit Suisse lowered its projection from nearly 3% to 0.9%, citing sinking crude prices. If the rate does in fact fall into the 0% range, it would be the first time since 1999, right after the Asian financial crisis, when consumer price growth dipped to 0.8%. The nation's inflation rate has remained in the 1% range since November 2012. The slide in oil prices has some going so far as to raise the prospects of deflation in Korea given the low inflation rate and slowing domestic demand. However, Finance Minister Choi kyung hwan dismissed those concerns on Wednesday. Instead, he said they could end up benefiting Korea as the lower import prices of oil would help the country boost domestic demand. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Korea's Samsung Electronics says it will likely post fourth quarter profits that beat an, an analyst estimate, rather thanks to strong demand for memory chips. The smartphone and memory chip maker's likely profit was still down 37 percent compared to last year, confirming Samsung's first annual profit fall in three years. Our Jim Young-gyu has more. In a guidance released on Thursday, Samsung Electronics said its operating profit would likely be 4.7 billion U.S. dollars in the October to December period of 2014, beating expectations. However, profits are down almost 37.5 percent from a year earlier, confirming its first annual profit decline since 2011. But the fourth quarter figure still marks a rebound from the company's third quarter profits of $3.6 billion, which was Samsung's lowest quarterly profit in more than three years. Fourth quarter sales likely fell more than 12 percent on-year at some $47 billion, but that's up $4.5 billion from the previous quarter. Market analysts say increased demand for memory chips helped limit the impact of shrinking smartphone profits, as Samsung's Galaxy line struggles to compete with Apple's iPhone and cheaper Chinese rivals. Analysts presume Samsung's semiconductor division performed better than the cash cow mobile business from October to December period of last year, helped by a rise in demand for memory chips that go into personal computers and smartphones. The mobile division's fourth quarter profits improved slightly from the previous quarter due to pickup in sales of premium smartphones like the Galaxy Note 4 and efforts to lower marketing costs. Samsung did not provide a breakdown of its divisional profits as the final earning figures are due to be released later this month. Kim young Arirang News. More on Korea's tech giant. Samsung Electronics is grabbing the world's attention at the ongoing consumer electronics show with its Internet of Things technologies. According to U.S.-based magazine Bloomberg Business Week, Samsung's pledge to connect most of its products to the web within two years is one of the most important things to watch at the Las Vegas event. The report says the campaign fits Samsung well, as it already makes sophisticated electronic devices and household appliances on a global scale. However, the magazine added that it may take Samsung longer than the envisioned two years for the plan to become reality and for consumers to embrace Internet-enabled home appliances. Sliding oil prices have pushed down international raw material prices as well to a nearly six-year low. The Commodity Research Bureau Index, which compiles data of 21 staple commodities including grain, crude and metal, and metal hit 225.8. 38 points on Tuesday. That's the lowest it's been since April 2009. Compared to the first half of last year, West Texas Intermediate crude has dropped 55 percent in value, gold 8 percent, and copper 12 percent. Analysts forecast prices to remain low or drop even further, at least through the first half of this year, citing the oversupply of international crude and economic uncertainties in major economies around the globe. The Eurozone has officially entered deflation. Consumer prices lost ground to close out 2014 on the back of sliding oil prices, forcing the economic bloc's central bank to make plans for stimulus measures. Our Song ji Sun reports. Inflation in the Eurozone is now growing at a negative rate, otherwise known as deflation. Consumer prices shrank 0.2% in the last month of 2014 from a year earlier, 
even lower than the market forecast of a 0.1 percent drop. It is the first negative reading seen since the 2009 financial crisis and comes mostly due to the falling oil prices, which have been slashed in half since June 2014. The price of Brent crude dipped below $50 per barrel earlier this week for the first time in five and a half years. Deflation is the worst that can happen. Deflation means consumers no longer consume, hoping that tomorrow products will be cheaper. The latest figure, far below target inflation of just under 2 percent, is pressing the European Central Bank to take action, likely in the form of quantitative easing. The ECB will start to buy sovereign bonds in the first quarter and hoping for a positive market reaction, which could also trigger some more optimism, some more investments. Other indicators are just as gloomy with the weakening euro currency. Unemployment in Italy has a record high of over 13 percent, and the inflation rate in Germany is also expected to dip below zero. The ECB will meet on January 22nd, three days before a snap election in Greece. Song ji Arirang News. With fears that the latest outbreak of foot and mouth disease might spread further, Korea has stepped up efforts to contain it. In fact, the latest data shows that the government has spent billions of dollars to deal with contagious livestock disease over the past four years alone. Our Lee ji -yun tells us more. 2.7 billion U.S. dollars. That's how much the Korean government has spent over the last four years to deal with livestock diseases. According to the Agriculture Ministry on Thursday, the government spent more than $2.5 billion between 2010 and 2011. This is when the country had to slaughter over 3 million animals in the nation's largest outbreak of foot and mouth disease. On top of that, $75 million went toward dealing with avian influenza, where over 6 million chickens and ducks were culled. The money covered the costs of slaughtering the animals, sterilizing infected farms, and compensating farmers. In the latest outbreak of foot and mouth disease that started last month, over 28,000 pigs have been slaughtered so far, already incurring a loss of some $9 million. But the government is hoping to save some of the cost this time. Instead of slaughtering all animals at infected farms, the government's policy now is to selectively slaughter only the ones showing symptoms of infection. Along with strengthened quarantine measures, the government is considering penalizing farmers that don't vaccinate their livestock. Experts also say that the government should set aside a bigger budget for animal vaccination and quarantine to keep diseases from breaking out in the first place. Despite the efforts, though, the Agriculture Ministry confirmed another case of the disease in Sejong City on Thursday. The ministry said authorities have already culled three of the nearly 3,700 pigs at the farm. Lee Ji-yoon, Arirang News. Now, some artists work all their lives just to have their works shown in major museums. And uh, the National Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art aims to extend that opportunity to all artists, especially the younger ones who can't wait to be up there in the spotlight. Our Im Yuni joins us with more on this. Yuni? Good afternoon, Ray. So one of the oldest resident programs at the National Museum of Modern and Contemporary, or Contemporary Art, also known as the MMCA, uh, one of their oldest resident programs is called the Young Artist Program. Now every year they select a few of the top young artists who display the most potential. And the 2014 edition of this program has chosen its finalists and put their work on display. Here's a look at some of the young artists you want to keep an eye out for this year. Silently a cloud of reaching hands, shivering in the wind, a peek into a land of fantasy and wonder. But what are these hands reaching for? And where is this water going? A huge pile of what appears to be rubbish, overrun by flowing water, a seemingly wasteful cycle. A handful of the most talented up-and-coming young Korean artists illustrate their views and comments on the problems of our society. 
The Young Korean Artist Program was started in 1982 at MMCA, and this time for the 18th edition, we've chosen eight different artists over 40 different works of various styles. Previous artists took more direct approaches to their works, but these artists took an oblique approach that resulted in dark, fairy tale like experience. And through this dark fairy tale theme, these artists convey their message, such as young artist No Sang Ho, whose Martian wagon looks like it came right from the circus. The dozens of plaster drawings tell the stories of individuals, people encountered by the artist himself. I took this piece to the streets and told my story to the people. Then I would listen to their stories as well as their feedback to my story. After that, it would be my turn again, and I would write my story once more. This process is what led to my next project. This time, artist No creates a visually limited experience, causing a heightened response to each image and drawing that does get caught by the spotlight. Images from the circus with a shroud of eerie gloom. They hang next to drawings of people, stories of individuals, who all, coincidentally, are visually impaired, hindered either by opaque glasses or by a complete lack of eyes altogether. This piece is about a town full of blind people, and that's exactly what you'll experience as well. You can't see every part of the piece, just what your flashlight allows. Because people cannot see the entire meaning of the work, it requires them to use their imagination to connect the drawings and ultimately connect the dots. Through this project, you can enter and exit a whole different world. And other artists turn to different senses, some more pungent than others. A revolting stench that overrides all other senses, except the sense of urgency. The abstract works of art that contain images of life and death, things we encounter in our everyday lives. Ideas and thoughts that are up for interpretation that will hopefully someday lead to a better tomorrow. Mm, quite an experience for the senses. Exactly. So these pieces, mm. they, I, I believe they are created with certain purpose in mind, right? Exactly. So these artists are there to sort of address an issue that they feel uh, was, is present within our society. So you just saw in the report uh, one of the latter pieces called Bedwetting by artist Kim Do-hee and it's a huge sheet that is absolutely saturated with urine. So that was really just a, a powerful experience that really hit at you. But uh, the artist says that this piece is meant to sort of instill this idea of children's nightmares um, and their fears. And the viewer in turn reflects on their own fears, their own traumas and uh, nightmares as well. So these kinds of work all uh, the artists are aiming to address issues that they really feel is a uh, part of our, our world. Well, I can still feel it. I can smell it in my head just by right. watching it. It's, piece. it's, really it's strong quite a strong piece. piece. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting how the young artists are always bold and really, uh, they're very eager and willing mm -hmm. to experiment and really push the boundaries. So definitely there is something that makes them stand out from traditional, I guess, the previous generation or the current generation of established artists, mm -hmm. right? So with young artists, there's definitely something different about their work, about their style. Uh, there's a sense of rawness with their work, um, definitely an imaginative sense with these works in particular as well. And so these, I noticed with these artists, they leave a lot of room for interpretation. So uh, for example, the artist that I interviewed, you know, I asked, or I talked to him and I said, this particular piece kind of makes me think this way and he's like yeah well I didn't really think of it that way but that's definitely a way you can look at it and so I think these artists are definitely open for different types of interpretations and different points of views. Right quite a stark contrast to the uh, I guess the classic artists who are quite driven and Difference stuck on style, their perceptions right? and they Difference did not want opinion. outsiders mm -hmm. tossing their ideas into that so uh, well thank you for that report Uni. I, I look forward to more interesting and uh, very uh, fascinating and thought-provoking uh, displays of art next time. I will keep looking for good items.
Good afternoon, I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather forecast. The cool spell continues, obviously, and currently a cold wave advisory is in effect in the Gyeongsangbuk-do, Jungcheongbuk-do, and Gangwon-do provinces, especially in the mountainous regions. And a dry weather advisory continues along with this frigid, frigid cold weather in the east side of the peninsula. Now, we can expect our daytime highs to be above freezing, higher than yesterday, but still about 2 degrees lower compared to the seasonal averages. And we can expect clear skies across the nation today, and it looks like it'll stay that way, it, it'll stay that way until tomorrow when the cloud starts to move in. And taking a look at the readings for today, so it'll be at 0 this afternoon, while Gwangju and Busan will reach up to 5 and 7 degrees. And to other regions, Jejuwan gets up high at 8, Tokdo hits 4, while Nankungang is sunny at negative 5 degrees. Well, that's all for now, Michelle Park, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you for that, Michelle. Well, that's a wrap for us. Thank you for watching. We have more at 4 p.m. Korea time, so do join us then.